Alrighty, I am going to be working on the um, the PE dumper again. We left off last time with the TLS table stuff. As a reminder, this stream and all the streams I've been doing on this subject are uh, are the, 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 I'm not getting paid for them except for when people decide to go and become members. And by becoming a member, you get access to cool extra features. You get to see the code before it's done. Uh, maybe license it if you want. You can spend all that money again if I ever sell any of the stuff that I'm building. You, you won't get double charged because of the credit system. So go check out the membership stuff. That's what keeps me going. But uh, let's, let's get past that little intro section and get into what we're doing today. So I've got this dumper. And it goes all the way out to debug directories right now. I can find my PDB path. But then we started up, I was working on the TLS table and we don't have that coming out yet, right? So if we look here, the TLS table is, well, let me look at the run again. If we look at the data directories, after debug, the TLS table was the next one in this particular sample file that actually had some data. It looks like it's 40 bytes. We wanna figure out, uh, what to do with a TLS table. So there are two different structs here. I'm curious, 8, 16, so this is 32, 40 bytes. So this is gonna be one of those, okay. We might get an array of these. Or we might get an array of these. We want to extract the directory, the data directory for TLS table and then make sure that that data is going to fit inside the loaded data so that we can actually read it safely. And finally, we have to do this based on which version of the format we're using. So if it's a PE32 version or a PE32 plus version, we'll do different things. And if it's a PE32 version, then our TLS table count will become uh, the loaded data size divided by the size of this. And the TLS dir32 will become this the, the base direct the base address the plus the loaded data so the the beginning of the range specified by that directory is just the, the whole thing it makes up the array we want. This again all works. We just gotta do the plus version in this case. Okay, so
So TLS dir32 does not equal zero. Then I'll do a loop like this. And so we want to print probably like um, a label up top. <clears throat> Closing line and then some, some stuff like this. Okay, now just to get these a little more specific, these are V adders, so they should look like this. That will just leave it as a integer flags. We don't know yet. I'm not sure if I actually have mnemonics for the flags. Now with this one, these all are 64-bit instead of 32-bit. I don't get it. That's the clear. What are we? What are we missing? Missing close parenthesis before ah, because it doesn't say i plus equals. It says plus equals one. Oopsie. Uh-oh. Well, this shouldn't have happened. So let's go, I guess let's get into remedy. We want to see TLS dir count equals zero. We'll start from there. Okay, it's not loaded data size. That's a mistake. Loaded data dot size isn't right. It's the directory size that I want.
Okay, so there are flags being set. It's not like it's a reserved piece of nonsense data. Those do look like V adders. They are probably relocated or something. Like they probably need relocation information since those don't look like V offs. You know, if I go to like the base V adder, it looks like this and I compare it, you can see that these are all offsets from that base V adder. So those are real V adders. They need to get relocated when the DLL gets loaded. This total size being zero is a little funky. I mean, this is the size of the data. Let me read again what it said about that. size of zero fill okay that's not the total size that I, I misread that on my first time through this is the zero fill size Okay, that makes sense. Now the question is, what about the flags? What are the mnemonics on those? The four bits, 23 through 20, describe alignment info. Possible values are those defined as image scan align, which are also used to describe alignment of section and object files. Right, so we already have the align X list ready to go. So what we're talking about here then is something like here's our type for the flags that comes with this macro for getting the alignment. Do I have somewhere where I'm already? Yeah, but it's coupled in with section flags right now. So section flags needs to get decomposed, it seems like. 
we want a PE straight from section alignment. which would look like this. Okay, so now we can get the section alignment over here by just doing string eight align string equals PE straight from section alignment. PE TLS directory flags get a line This gets replaced with a line string, and so does this. A line, eight bytes. Cool. And that's the only thing that the uh, flags on the TLS directories do. So I think that's it for TLS table. What's next? So we got TLS table up here is done. Let's look at the um, TLS table. So load config table is not empty. Let's try that one. The load configuration structure was formally used in very limited cases in the Windows NT operating system itself to describe various features too difficult or too large to describe in the file header or optional header of the image. Current versions of Microsoft Linker and XP and later versions of Windows use a new version of this structure for 32-bit x86 based systems that include reserved SEH technology. This provides a list of safe structured exception handlers that the operating system uses during exception dispatching if the handler ad address resides in an image's VA range and is marked as reserved 
Destruction exception handler aware. That is image DLL characteristics. No SEH is clear in the DLL characteristics field of the optional header as described earlier. Then the handler must be in the list of known safe handlers for that image. Otherwise, the operating system terminates the application. This helps prevent the x86 exception handler hijacking exploit that has been used in the past to take control of the operating system. Microsoft Linker automatically provides a default load configuration structure to include the reserved SEH data. If the user code already provides a load configuration structure, you must include the new reserved SEH fields. Otherwise, the linker cannot include the reserved SEH data. Okay. Data directory entry for a pre-reserved SEH load configuration structure must be specified. Must specify a particular size of the load configuration structure, because the operating system loader always expects it to expects it to be a certain value. In that regard, size is really only a version check. All right, so for this, I think we're gonna do split screen. not going to be able to figure out how to hide this because it goes away as soon as I try to inspect it. So here we go. A little bit wonky. The global loader flags to clear for this process as the loader starts the process. The default timeout value to use for this process is critical sections that are abandoned. Default yeah, critical section, default critical section timeout. Memory that must be freed before it is returned to the system in bytes. Memory that must be freed before it is returned to the system. Mr. What? Decommit free block threshold. Memory that must be freed before it is returned to the system. I'm not sure exactly what that's talking about. It must be talking about like the Windows heap alloc type stuff or something that sits on top of virtual alloc. That's my best guess. Total free threshold. Total amount of free memory in bytes. don't entirely know what those mean. Lock prefix table. x86 only. The VA of a list of addresses where the lock prefix is used so that they can be replaced with no op on single processor machines. Uh, 
Really? You want to take the lock out? Okay. That's fancy. I think that's a V adder can, based on what, how they described it. Maximum allocation size. Virtual, maximum virtual memory size. Virtual memory threshold. Process affinity mask. Setting this field to a non-zero value is equivalent to calling set process affinity mask with this value during startup. Process affinity mask. Process heap flags. Process heap flags that correspond to the first argument of the heap create function. These flags apply to the process heap that is created during process startup. Right, so this is talking about the heap in this case for sure. Process heap flags. The service pack version identifier. No idea about that. Let's just go CSD version. Moving on. Reserved one. Edit list. Oh, those are both U16s, aren't they? Reserved for use by the system. Reserved two. Security cookie. A pointer to a cookie that is used by Visual C++ for or GS implementation. Wonder what kind of pointer we're talking about. I think they might mean F off. Sometimes they use pointer to mean an F off, a file offset. So that's saying it's a virtual address of the sorted tables for the relative virtual addresses of each valid, unique, structured exception handler in the image. So structured exception handler table v adder. SEH count. Guard CF dispatch function. The virtual address where control flow. Wait. The virtual address where control flow guard check function pointer is stored. Virtual address where control flow guard check function pointer is stored. Guard check function check function pointer. Why is it CF check pointer? G CF check function. CF dispatch function. So control flow check function. Got it. What we're talking about is the control flow guard check function v adder control flow guard dispatch function v adder control flow guard function table the va of the sorted table of rvas of each control flow guard function in the image function table v adder control flow guard function count control flow guard related flags Code integrity information. That's sort of non specific and cryptic and don't know what that means exactly. 
guard address taken IA table guard address taken control flow guard address taken IAT table V adder guard address taken IAT and count guard long jump target table target count V adder. Okay, that's all of them. If I got it lined up correctly, that'll be impressive because there's a lot of fields here. And then to actually test it out, what I also need to do is make the 64 bit version. Decommit. Decommit. Lock. Maximum allocation size, virtual memory threshold, process affinity mask, so sixteen sixteen reserved. Security cookie sixty four, sixty four, sixty four. So this is going to go all the way down until we get to the guard flags. That's still a four byte. And then after code integrity, everything else is sixty four bytes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. V split, there we go. PE dump. <sighs> Parse load config. PE load config 32. Load config 64. If good and cough header does not equal zero, extract a directory. Load config table. If PE32 does not equal zero, if the size of PE load config 32 is less than or equal to dir size, then load config 32 equals PE load config 32, loaded data dot string plus dir v off, else if PE 32 plus does not equal zero, then uh, this becomes 64 bit version. And then we've got load config. If load config 32 does not equal zero. load config equals and you line down here and then a big bunch of these
Hold on, before I do that, let me do a pass through here, making some of these into hex. Fine, 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 fine. Here, I might need to figure out what global flags means at some point, but let's start by just making it hex. That'll be a little easier. These might want to be in memory sizes. We'll take a look at that. This is definitely hex. This is probably something we can get the um, mnemonics for. We want mnemonics here. We want mnemonics here. And here. That's fine, that's fine. This one is hex. 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 Mnemonics. Hex. Code integrity. Code integrity without a T at the end. Yeah. 
And then to actually see this, I probably have to do the 64-bit version. So I need to see it next, so I'll do that. Even though it's possibly going to mean I have to do a little bit of work that is the same on both later. I still need to be able to see it to make the next step anyway. So we'll just have to do that duplicate work. It's the only easy way. So let's see. It starts from decommit free block threshold. Decommit free block threshold. Yeah, these become 64 bits for a little while. One, two, three, four. Virtual process affinity mask is the last one. And it picks back up again with reserved two. And that goes on until control flow guard flags. Which stays 32 bit. Code integrity stays the way it is. And then the last four are 64 bit. There's our load config. Okay, that's not an F off. That's a V adder. So let's rename that. You know what I wish there was? I wish there was a way to do like percent question mark and then something like this and then do like j plus one is less than array count. So you have a boolean first and then the character. So then this would print, this would just be a modifier here that optionally eliminates this so it can become empty based on a boolean. You know what I mean? Might be another modification I can make to the printf if I take a look. So it's a v adder, v adder, v adder. These are all zero. Don't know what that means. Okay, so there's a little bit here with the control flow guard stuff that seems filled in. The security cookie thing seems filled in. But yeah, this is largely not useful information. So I'm not going to spend too much time tracking down the mnemonics here just because it looks like this is a relatively low amount like I don't have a lot of traction here I would need some examples to fill in these doing interesting things and I would probably have to spend more time figuring out what each of these pieces means in more detail and that's gonna be like a get bogged down into this particular structure and the unique corner case systems that are able to be activated by it and I kinda wanna move on and get get through more parsing there might be lower hanging fruit than this stuff so even though it's like only three quarters of the way done because I skipped over the mnemonics. I think I'll call there on the load fit config. Okay. What comes after that? We look at run. 
load config here. So next up, bound. No, that's not empty. IAT. Okay, this is the last one that we have. So Import address table. The structure and content of the import address table are identical to those of the import lookup table until the file is bound. During binding, the entries in the import address table are overwritten with the 32-bit for PE32 or 64-bit for PE32 plus addresses of the symbols that are being imported. These addresses are the actual memory addresses of the symbols, although technically they are still called virtual addresses. The loader typically processes the binding. Okay, so that's something I don't need to do anything with, right? That is for the loader to have memory space to construct the actual, like, linking at load time that needs to happen. And so we just don't do anything there, which means, which means I am now done with making progress on this parser by going through this. Cool. Um, I'm at about an hour of streaming. I'm going to do a few minutes of a break just to get up, clear my head, not stare at the screen for more than an hour straight, right? I'll be back in uh, five minutes or so, and then I'll figure out what we're going to do next. Now that this approach to gathering as much parse info as we can is done, probably need to start thinking about what we're going to do to dive into the sections that we have. Um, or this might be it for the executable, and I might switch to the object file. Pilfer says, no, the follower timer just ended. What does that mean? Is there something going on that I'm missing? I'm not like a um, Twitch expert. So if, you, if you're telling me something about followers. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Your first time follow, 10 minute. Okay, well, if you want to talk, I will hang out for a minute. I'm ha happy to sit and chat. I won't have to look at the screen while we're doing that. I still take a five minute break soon, but yeah, if you wanted uh, if you wanted to ask a question or comment about something, I'll hang out for a minute. Um, your first question is why not use macros? I'm not sure what you mean. Where am I? I am using macros in a lot of places. Um, if you mean macros as in like C macros, like I've got X lists all over the place for defining enums and flags and stuff. And also things like get a line. Uh, if you mean over here for printing this stuff, um, I mean, it's an interesting question. It would be like print hex process heap flags. I mean, how would I align the equal signs? I don't know exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah, I do use macros. I use macros mostly for defining type definitions and things that look like functions. I will occasionally also use macros, but I don't like to do, like, like I've tried and experimented, and I don't like li lots of fancy printing macros. So that's one I don't usually go for. Um, I like X lists the most. I do a lot of X list stuff. Yeah, C makes it real hard. The problem is... I don't know. I, I've seen stuff before that can actually figure this sort of stuff out a little better. But like in C, it, you have to mark it one way or another because there's no way to overload a function, really, right? This is like you have to tell it what type. You have to tell it in the string what type it is. And even if I switch to macros, then the macro names need to be different for each type. Um Uh, so yeah, it's it's not it's not 
a super ergonomic language for this kind of work. It's not great if you want to um, inspect the types, or inspect your data by defining a, a struct and overlaying it on memory and then look. C doesn't help you with that a lot. Um, just sad. The um, The other thing is here, sooner or later, I don't want to be printing anymore. Like, I don't want to overinvest in a complex and rich way of doing this. So, like you could imagine making systems for auto indenting the equal signs to align each other or something to align to each other. But I'm actually my long term goal for all of this is to not just be making a dumper that goes to the command line or to an output file, but to actually make a visual inspector of your object files, executable files and stuff like that so that you can uh ultimately i want to be able to make a, like a linker a, a gui a linker with a gui or something like that like i want to be able to show you how linking is happening happening graphically so like this stuff is all going to get replaced with some kind of generic um information node system at some point and at that point I might try to automate the typing of things a little differently but we're just we're just trying to comprehend the uh, file formats right now I'm coming off of, alright this is from um, Pilfers now I'm coming off a Rust project that's kind of similar I wrote a Hermes bytecode this is, ooh what's Hermes is that a that's a bytecode I might not have heard of. Hermes bytecode. I don't know what that means exactly. But some sort of bytecode disassembler assembler. Um, for the UI, I'm probably going to build build the UI myself. I don't generally like using pre-existing UI frameworks. I've already like toyed with it a little bit and I've built many UIs and other pro like programs before. Um, this one isn't necessarily good. I haven't touched it since like February so I can't remember if I was liking the way this felt yet. But um, I've built plenty of these so I don't mind doing it this way. Uh, and I feel like it takes forever for me to get the hang of a framework. So uh, it's generally the way I go. Um, anyways. Uh, Banana Pooper asks, will this visualizer be eventually integrated into the RAD debugger, or is it totally unrelated? So I don't work at the, on the RAD debugger anymore. I'm, I'm, um, as of January, I'm no longer working at Epic. I started my own independent thing. So in case, since you were talking about it, if you like the sound of the project, um, you can be support or become a member of the Mr. Fourth Lab over at mrforth.com slash membership. And there's lots of cool perks including that all the money you spend supporting me, you get to spend it again on the software packages that I uh, do to choose to sell. A lot of what I come out with is open source, and I count on people to s support me to make that possible. But occasionally I'm going to sell something, like maybe the visualizer program. And uh, money you spend supporting me would also kind of be like pre-purchasing that software package that I come up with. The... Uh, the RAD debugger won't contain this, though, unless they decide to build a similar thing inspired by it. It's sort of an independent project. Uh, since I don't directly work on the RAD debugger anymore, I am using a lot of my experience from being on the RAD debugger uh, to sort of get me going faster through this. You know, I've, I've written a PE parser before. I'm trying to go hardcore and, like, leave no stone unturned just out of curiosity right now. Um, but, like, you know, it's not my first rodeo. I've, I've been through all these data directories and sections and things like that before for the most part. I think I haven't done load config. That was new today. I don't think I did the uh, TLS table before either. That was new, but like debug directories I knew about, exception handlers, relocations. This is all old hat to me at this point. So 
uh, I, I'm mostly doing this just to get it into my own code base without just you know copy pasting code. I don't know that it would be cool to copy paste the code from Rad Debugger, even though it's open source. I'm kind of just like let's let's get a fresh let's get a fresh iteration of all of this code again, and then from there we'll start abstracting. So I think I'm gonna take my break. I, when I come back, if there are more questions or thoughts, I'll be happy to talk about it. But I need a, a voice break and an eye break, so I will be back in about five minutes.
All right. So the question is, where do we pick up from here? What's the what's the next goal? We're kind of going to be doing a little conversation at this point. This is a, you know, I might be looking at my notebook. I might be thinking about. I might be thinking about if this is everything I want on PE cough, or if there's other stuff worth doing before I move on to elf. I think. The biggest thing is I've done all the image specific stuff. If I were to dump an object file, a lot of stuff would be missing. Let me show you. So here we're getting, you know, this good stuff we're used to getting. We then get all of these sections. And that's it. That's all we get. And the reason we don't get much is because the rest of what we did was all off of data directories, which is a part of the image files extended, he extended headers. But a lot of the same information actually has to exist right here inside these sections somewhere. And so we might want to be able to parse that data out of these sections. All right, here's a TLS section. 16 bytes on the file size, right? This must be getting con converted. V size, V off, file size, F off. So, so this is 16 bytes in the file, which must, in the object file, which must be 16 bytes of uh, initialized data for creating the TLS data in the final executable. There's also this directive thing, which I know there's information about. There's also debug, which we haven't even done any parsing of debug yet because debug is not technically in the same category as binary object file stuff, but the object files carry the debug information through. And then in the Windows tool chains, what happens is this information gets split off by the linker into a separate output file called the PDB Whereas on a Linux style uh, linker, this goes through to the executable file as dwarf, which is here it'll be stored as something called code view. We could go looking into all that, but So let me start making a to-do list here. There's a couple of things that we can mark off. So first of all, Process heap flags, control flow guard flags. Wombanier Wumba says, hi, I'm a big fan of a lot of your projects. Are you taking inspiration from wine here? That's an interesting question. No, I have never looked at wine source code, but it's an interesting qu idea. I want to do some streams sometime soon. Uh, I have, by the way, if you're hanging out, I'm going to Handmade Boston to give a talk this weekend. Um, you know, if you go over to handmadecities.com and you look at uh, the Boston conference, um, this is happening this weekend. 
and I don't know what day yet, but first or second day, well, there's, there's two different days, several speakers on each day, but I'll be uh, doing a couple hour presentation there uh, with along with Abner and plenty of other people. So uh, I will be busy this weekend and recovering from travel for a little bit after that, but sometime soon, sometime soon I would like to start doing a style of stream where I grab some code. I actually did this earlier this year where I was grabbing some SAT solvers, some open source SAT solvers and learning about them by reading their code. So it might be interesting to dive into something like reading wine. I had not thought of that before. It's a very big one to go into, but I had thought about doing other things like diving into GDB that I, I used to read GDB code and it's just like nuts. So go looking at code can be interesting for different reasons. One, it can help you learn how a certain system works. Two, sometimes someone writes some code in a way that is very, um, makes things very neat and simple and learning how to do things the simple way. What, basically there's like learning by reading really good code is one reason to read code. Learning how a system works is one reason to read code. And sometimes it's just because you need to dive into the code and you're literally trying to maintain it or patch it and then you, you have a reason to read code. But I'd love to spend some time doing the first two types here on stream where we just read code either to learn about how a system works or to learn from the code itself as sort of a code critique thing where we go in not knowing if how good the code will be and if we'll have better ideas than it or if it's gonna have better ideas than us and also maybe learn a system along the way. And wine is a really interesting idea for that. Deagle50 asks, are you still working on Forcoder? No, I don't work on Forcoder anymore. If you go to um, the uh, Forcoder Discord, which I don't have a link for, I keep saying I need to do this. There is a Forcoder Discord, um, but like this is like a few years old, like three or four years old website for Forcoder. And I haven't updated it here, but um, Let's see. Yeah, if you go to this link right here, this will redirect you to the Forcoder Discord, actually, not the Handmade Network Discord. And uh, that is where you can find people who are still working on Forcoder. There's an open source community fork version and lots of people who can help you if you have any issues with it. Yeah, fear of code says this too. A couple of people are saying this. I was just about to say the open source code can be littered with extra options and variations of the problem you don't care about. GNU projects are a great example. Yeah, that's definitely true. And that's why I would call it a code critique rather than learning from the code. Sometimes um, if you go into to, with the mindset that I'm gonna learn from it and you learn to do all of its patterns rather than being critical and thinking like, why did they do this this way here? You might start picking things up for the wrong reason and you might also miss the opportunity to go, hey, I think that redoing this section in a much simpler, cleaner way has the potential to unlock use cases that are kind of, what people I think miss a lot, what programmers miss is that lots, adding lots of code to a thing, adding, adding support for variations actually also limits how many use cases are available. The more, the more code you have, the more specific your code is, and the more specific it is, the more narrow it, the more narrowly it applies. It's very hard to write more code in a way that extends options and not making it, and instead of making them more narrow, right? Really simple stuff that you can reuse has the property that it's very easy to adapt it into new use cases, whereas big complex knots are really only suited to exist inside the context where the knot has been tied, and so. That's why I think of it as a code critique. Like, go in, see what the, see what they've got. If it's bad code, think about what are the key parts here that you would pull out, and that creates opportunities for new or simpler implementations of of, sim of similar systems. And if it's good code, sometimes it is good code, and it's like someone tried to write really good example code. You know, if if I go and pull up a couple of mini Lisp examples where someone tries to write a Lisp interpreter in a thousand lines or 500 lines or 2000 lines. Some of it will be a little silly because it's kind of code golf to make it small, but a lot of it will be pretty clever. You'll get, you'll get to like have these light bulb moments of like, Oh, it really could be that simple to set up an interpreter for Lisp. And there's no reason not to do it that way, which is an experience I've had too. So um, I, I'd say that 
you want to approach it as if it's possible for it to out to, for it to teach you, but you want to be critical because a lot of times it's not going to ha not not everything there is going to be something you want to just blindly take as a good idea for your version of the code. Okay. Anyways, um, I'm gonna undo these so that I don't have to do scattered everywhere. I've got the mnemonics to do's pulled out into a single spot for later to c reconsider. But the dumping code is just gonna follow what the main code defines, and the main code defines these as things to do later. So, again, looking at what we've got with the object file, the big thing we're missing is that the object file relies on special sections to carry more data, and we're not doing anything with special sections yet. So let's see if we can start figuring this out. What is the directive section doing? Maybe that will be a good place to start. Actually, it says it. this list here puts... So this is the interesting list we want to look at, I think. Um, special sections we'll keep that link right there so this is the one we want to look at and why is it not snapping me back to the good spot in fact it's scrolling me around random the here we go We could start by just dealing with the debug stuff since it comes first. We have over here a debug S, a debug S, a debug T. I think the problem with these is that they're going to be code view. Yeah, they're just going to be code view ranges. Like, they're just going to be... De the, the debug format contained in a section and that's going to be a whole separate thing we have to parse so I am actually going to skip debug we'll go to the directive section see what we can do with that a section is a directive section if it has the image scan link info flag set in the section header and has the directive section name so direct link info yes and the directive name direct okay Section name. The linker removes a directive section after processing the information, so the section does not appear in the image file that is being linked. Sure. A directive section consists of a string of text that can be encoded as ANSI or UTF-8. The UTF-8 byte order marker is not present. The directive string is interpreted as ANSI. Okay, so we want to look for a, a byte order marker. and then t uh, consume that if it's there. And then you see either UTF-8 or ANSI, we just UTF-8. The directive string is a series of linker options that are separated by spaces. Each option contains a hyphen, the option name, and any appropriate attribute. If an option contains spaces, the option must be enclosed in quotes. The directive section must not have relocations or line numbers. Okay, so this is like some text-based programming of the linker from the object file, I guess. Let's take a look at what's in this one. It's got 121 bytes, so it'll be interesting. Um,
All right, so we want to loop over the sections. For each one, if the section contains a flag called link info section flag link info so if we got link info and what was the other thing it said the name needs to match if straight c string how long is one two direct one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight characters. We need a C string limited form finally. I can't avoid it anymore. So the idea here is we have some second pointer that says find pull out a C string here, but also don't iterate past this point. If the section name matches directive, But here we found ourselves a directive section. So what we're going to do is parse whatever it says goes in the directive section. Um, OK, it's just a string. Right, right, right. So we're going to have a directives list here. And then the goal is first, let's look at um, section data is going to be the input data dot string plus section section header f off of course we need another check here which is if the section f off plus the section f size is less than or equal to the input data size so we don't want to overflow during our read here then we get our section data, and we're going to go if the section f size is greater than or equal to 3. It's going to be section data plus section f size. Uh, directive putter equals section data. If section data zero equals blah and section data one equals blah and section data two equals blah this gets incremented by three e 
BF, BB, BF. Pilfers, welcome back. All right, so the section data. No, I want the directive pointer to be incremented. And then I want the rest is just getting pushed onto the directive. So straight list push directives arena straight range directive putter to section OPL. I bet you it's null terminated. We'll take a look at what that does. Wrong order. So we don't see anything new yet, but what if I come down here and I'm like, all right, cool. So we've got all the exe stuff going. What about the object file stuff? And we go dump direct linker directives. Node directive stop first m4 printf i don't know exactly how to expect this to look right now so i'm going to kind of have to mess around with it a little bit this is going to be our linker directives like this maybe and then like this I don't know we're gonna find out okay so you said you're trying to make a header object explore utility and show off some linker goodness yeah that's right that's what I'm trying to do um, I'm trying to make it work on first of all on dumping exes and object files which is what I'm doing now and then upgrade from dumping to visualizing and then upgrade from visualizing the data structures to visualizing the linking process. And then finally also doing things like making it um, cross-platform applicable to cough and binary and elf and uh, maybe even someday including debug information in the visualization and all that. So the string that I got is very interesting. It's got a bunch of spaces and then include base before main, default lib, default lib, lib cmc, old names, interesting. Okay, cool. So that's that's the directive um, section type. Let's see. What else is on the list up here? Directive e data image only. I data. Is that not image only? All image files that import symbols, including virtually all executables. Okay, and did we have one here? 
No, we don't have one anyway. I data? No. Okay. P data. Do we have any P data? Yeah, we have P data here. This looks like an object file thing because there's no virtual size. There is a file size. We also want to be able to look at. So, one thing we haven't done is because the executable. Let's go back. The run. When I look at a binary file like the Mr. Fourth Base DLL, look at the results. The sections here have no relocation information, right? Because that's not how relocation information works inside of an image file. But in an object file, we do have that. So we might actually want to go and look at the relocations for each section as one of our things here. So let me make a to-do list of um, dumper features. So we were just saying, what about pdata? pdata section contains an array of function table entries that are used for exception handling. It is pointed to by the exception table entry in the image data directory. The entries must be sorted according to the function addresses, the first field needs structure, before being emitted into the final image. The target platform determines which of the following three. Okay, so we've already actually done this structure. If I go to pe.h, Somewhere in here, yeah, exception handling. We have this one, exception handler x86. Three, four byte integers. And so, it sounds like we're saying that if I look at the P data that comes out of this object file, I am gonna find an array of that struct. So we have two different ways we could extract these now. One of them Okay. Section. I want to iterate my sections. I want to find. Section plus equals one. Iterate my sections. Find one that is called p data. Break there. If we find that. Then we're going to do
section data, section OPL. We're going to do same thing as we did up here. We need to figure out which type we're using and then go this is going to be the input data dot string plus the p data section f off and then f size divided by this All right, got to get caught up on chat. Y'all are chatting a lot. Semi off topic, but have you played around with Imhex and the built-in pattern language at all? No, but that sounds so cool. That's something I've thought about. Like, that's a, that's a tool I've imagined before for like when you're staring at a hex file and like if this is what I'm imagining, like using type information to extract stuff in real like interactively from a hex file. Let's look it up real quick. So called imhex okay ooh looks like they're doing a dear i am gooey kind of look but then they got like a visual data processor that gets applied to the hex oh this looks cool This looks really cool. <laughs> okay, um, let's. Let's keep that around for a bit. Thanks for the recommendation. I like to use it when writing deserializer so I know my code is correct. Reasonable. It highlights all sections within the hex editor itself. Super useful. Yep, that sounds like what I've imagined before. This looks... And then it comes with... Oh, it's got the patterns for um, PE and COF data structures, like the ones I'm writing right now. That's cool. Hmm... Take a look what you got here. So this is your mhex type information for that bytecode thing you were telling me about. Very cool. Thanks for the recommendation. That's something I've thought about maybe I want to make, but now that I see that someone's thought like doing it. Oh, I got to go to the bottom. Okay. Debug info, debug info at debug info offset, debug info header. Header, header, header. Oh, and look at this. It does the, like the stuff where you can use ifs inside the data structure. So we can use information from earlier. Oh, it's got like the flexible type layout stuff. That's really cool. Oh, it's got like a switch thing so it can decode variable length. Oh man, that's so cool. Very nice.
Very cool. All right, so we could go and use the new safety version of C string everywhere that we're supposed to before the end of the day. But I was trying to make a to do. Dump relocations for each section is on the to do. Um, was there other stuff I had in mind? I did the directives. I think. Okay. This is funky. It looks like it's getting a flag we don't know about. Hmm. Okay. We were trying to do this, right? We were in the middle of P data when I got distracted by uh, thinking about the relocation sections. So we pull out the P data section. We set up the exception handlers that way. Now the question is, do they come out looking reasonable? Begin V off zero, end V off 42, unwind V off zero. I'm going to make a wild guess here. I bet you the P data comes with relocations. Yeah, comes with a big chunk of relocations, 540 of them. 385 to 564. 564 minus 380. Well, 564 is this line number. So let's subtract 384. Multiply by 2, we get 360. If I did it again, 720, okay. And we said that the number of relocations is 540. There it is. So what's happening is each exception handler is coming with three locate relocations, one for each of these. That's what's happening. And therefore, it's not super useful to look at this in its current state. This is like uh, before relocations have been applied. So, let me think. The object file is only going to be interesting in terms of how relocations are mixed in. So, this is a spot where the limitation of the text version is starting to show, where we could visualize the presence of relocations on all of our data if we could do visualization. But as it stands, that is missing. Let me add that to a big, like, longer term to do All right, so that's P data.
What is R data? Read only initialized data. So these are all just, all the rest of what we have here is only interesting as far as it all has relocation information. Um, but all of this, like, that's exception data. Did we already do X data? No, we didn't. Okay, what is X data's structure? Exception information. Let's see what you have to say about X data. You don't say anything about X data? That's just another free data structure. What about SX data? We don't have any of that. All right, it looks like I'm actually at the end here. Like there's not a lot I can do. Hey, Young Lane, welcome. Yeah, there's not a lot I can do. Like I, I've done ev all the dumping that I can do. So the next step has to be to start answering higher level questions because just dumping has kind of hit its hit its end point here. Let me um put in the checkpoint. And let me track down those safety C string spots real quick. So I'll just cap off that way so we're not getting any buffer overflows but it's not it might be that it should be capped more tightly than that to be robust and I'm not sure but at the very least it won't crash Export V off, export range Dur Yeah, so we want this to stay inside of the export range. Yeah, well, okay, so pilf pilfers, that's exactly the sort of the mental model I have of it, too. You start off with dumping, and then you switch from plain text dumping to putting out some kind of um, easy-to-use data structure for other users, and then you can start linking that up with usage cases. Um, uh, and you can also drop out of dumping out like serialized data structures to just using an API for all of that. That's all great. What I can't do though is the dumping doesn't contain like high level questions. So if I'm a user pulling in an object file and I want to ask a question like, does this object file define a function with this string name? I don't have an answer to that yet. But that information exists inside the object file. So what I need to do now is start going for instead of starting from the data definitions and dumping data definitions, I need to start thinking about what are high level questions I want to be able to ask and the, the pressure of answering those higher level questions will fill out more information about more. Inf it'll do more information abstra uh, extraction.
Uh, yeah, let's check out the printf. Let me show you. So I didn't write the base printf. The way I do it is I get the stbsprintf library, uh, which is a, you know, well-developed and tested printf, uh, printf implementation, or sprintf implementation at least. It doesn't depend on the file IO part of C, so it doesn't do anything with um, the file type, but you can do all the C string ver versions of the printf function. And that's just this, like here's, um, where is the, uh, like, let's go to sprint f, it's in here somewhere. Oh yeah, they're all, they're all wrapped. Um, <coughs> vs printf cb. Okay, right. So that, this looks like this. I didn't write any of this. I'm not responsible for it. This is some wild stuff. You can see here things like, let me grab something we could recognize. Um, okay, so up here, there are things like uh, marking the size of a type and then there are things like, you know, here's get the string, and you can see where like it gets the length of the string, and then it goes to s copy, and s copy does some work about like in you know the leading spaces or zeros and the trailing stuff. There's a there's a copy leader, copy leading zeros, copy leader if there's still one, and you know copy leading zeros is optimized. So you can see that like they're doing like hex level encoding of spaces so that they can do them four bytes at a time like this is hardcore okay so i don't write that what i do is i this is an open source public domain library in my base layer i have copy pasted the chunk of the header that that um the chunk of that library that does the sprintf and uh declarations and then the, the other chunk that does the sprintf definitions haven't wrote down the modifications here yet. And then I go and add some modifications. So like, here's a modification. If I put in a capital S, I've, you know, instead of a lowercase s, then I, off of the VR, I grab a string eight, and I then go to S copy, and I fill in all of these things to match what I want, right? Uh, basically the same as this, except you're getting the length now from, um, stir.size, right? So stir.size is being used and I'm checking the precision and stuff. So I'm just reusing the already existing constro control structures. I also have this capital N, which just lets you put in a number and prints that many spaces so that I can more easily create indented text. Um, So that's what I do. I use S pr STBS printf as a starting point, and then I put in my modifications. So like, let's take a look here. I've made a list. Uh, looks like question mark is open. So my idea of doing a question mark based uh, specifier would mean I'd come up here and do the question mark. And then I'd have to figure out how I'm gonna, like I might need to add a new local variable that's just like, do we ignore this specifier? And if we do, then what would happen is something like, once I've done the extraction, like I do the, I need to let the VAR run either way. But once all the VAR work is done, I would need to come in here and have it go like, hey, if we are, if we failed a the conditional, then like skip or something, right? And I'd have to do that on S copy and there's a couple others I'd have to do it on. Um, I don't think S copy is the only one where we do writing out to the final buffer, but that's the big one. There's some ones up here that might go flow through something else. Um, I guess these all eventually go to S copy. I'd have to learn it a little more carefully. I think that maybe all the printing to the final output buffer goes through S copy. So if I put my conditional there, I could be able should be able to consume everything the same way it always gets consumed, and then just not print anything if the question mark didn't evaluate to, to true. Okay, so 
answered that question. I think we're done with pulling stuff out of the object file at this point. The next step needs to be to approach this from a high level instead of from a low level. So we've done all the low level stuff. Oh wait, I was doing the C string fixes. That's what I want to finish doing. Input data debugger. Input data dot string plus debugger f off plus debugger size. Okay, so that's all of those. Let me save that. Use the new straight C string capped wherever appropriate. All right. How am I doing on time? I have reached two hours, so. Um, I think I'll wrap it up there because I need to do a little bit of big picture thinking about what my next steps are and I'm feeling like that's the kind of work that's hard to do on stream um, mostly because it just requires me to like draw pictures and and bounce balls off of walls and think with think with my slow brain for a little while so it's not as fun to watch and once I figured out what the next big uh once I figure out, I was, uh, Young Lane, I was out of coffee before we started today, before, or before you got here. I ran out of coffee real fast. Um, once I have figured out what the next big steps are, then I will be able to pick this back up and continue from there. It might be that I want to do some high level stuff on these data structures that I've already got. It might be that I want to switch over to Elf and see where they start to see about thinking about the abstraction layer there i'm not entirely sure yet i'm gonna give myself some time to explore there are some other less less likely but also possibly interesting things on my mind so i guess we'll see but uh if you liked the sound of this project today and you want to help i i could use a lot of support to keep this going i'm counting on all of my income right now it comes from supporters and members uh you get you get a good look here at the various things that you get as rewards but the biggest reward, hopefully, is that you know you're interested in my projects and would like me to be able to keep doing them. Uh, so consider that if you are interested, and it would be very much appreciated if you did do that. Uh, besides that, I don't have any specific schedule. Like I said earlier in the stream, I am going to Handmade Boston over the weekend, so I'm not going to promise anything in particular. But I will see you all around the internet. Okay, bye. <laughs>